Welcome to Shades of Us, the show that looks at a person's journey when it comes to race and self-identity. I'm Gary Pierre Pierre. On this episode, we'll look at the generational perspectives of race and ethnicity through the eyes of a black sociologist with European and Native American backgrounds, a multiracial Jewish millennial college student, and my own children who are a mix of Haitian and white. We start the conversation with Anne Morning. My name is Anne Morning. I'm an associate professor of sociology at New York University, and I think of myself as both a sociologist and a demographer. I think the question of racial ambiguity has just been, you know, a, a part of my experience since my, you know, earliest childhood. I had a babysitter when I was probably four years old who asked me one day, what race are you? Who is your family, white or black? And at the time, I didn't know. I didn't know what she was talking about. I said, well, I don't know, but I'll, I'll ask my parents. And she said, no, 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 don't, don't ask your parents. But of course, I, you know, I did that, that night at the dinner table, I did ask them. And I still remember when I asked that question, you know, mommy, daddy, you know, are we white or black? I remember just this silence descending on the room and I can only imagine what my parents felt. They, they must have felt like, okay, this is the end of the innocence. My dad said, uh, you know, we're, we're black, honey. And I was like, Oh, okay. You know, and for me, it was, it, it meant nothing. Both my mother and my dad have, in addition to their African ancestry, have uh, European and Native American ancestry. My mother also had some Asian ancestry. But, you know, they grew up very, very much in the era of the one drop rule. And so those other pieces of their ancestry were really never salient for them. My parents felt very much at home in Harlem. Um, but for me, it was a little bit of a schizophrenic experience because at the same time as I was growing up in Harlem, I was going every day to school at an international school, the United Nations School in, in Manhattan. I went there from kindergarten all the way through high school. And that was a world which not only was very, very diverse, much more so than, than Harlem was, um, but it was also a world which didn't have the same kinds of ideas about race and about racial identities that the people I knew in Harlem had. So in Harlem, you know, I was just black and it was kind of, it was unremarkable in that neighborhood. I certainly came in for some teasing for being light skinned. I had people call me high yellow. I had people not like me uh, because of what they thought I was like because of the way I looked. So I was conscious. And then at the same time, going to the United Nations school, I was in a world where generally people didn't see me as black. People um, maybe would see me as mixed. And I even had the, the experience of you know, knowing classmates who were from Africa who would say, why do you call yourself black? Like, to us, you don't look black. We wouldn't consider you, you black. Or, you know, in our countries, we wouldn't think of you as black. It never crossed my mind that I might not be good at something because of my background. I didn't grow up in a setting where people who looked like me were tracked into lower tier classes. I didn't grow up in a situation where um, you know, my teachers were all white, for example, and I didn't have any role models of color. I had fabulous math teachers from uh, the Caribbean, from India. I just, I was used to seeing other people of color holding important positions and, and being really respected scholars and teachers. So, so I really went to college with a lot of confidence that I think all too often kids of color in the United States don't get. They are too often in, in school systems where they're made to feel either like outsiders or like they, they're not really expected to achieve. My parents talked a lot about race. There were lots of dinner table conversations. My parents, I think, were this kind of classic black bourgeoisie. They were privileged, they, they were professionals, they knew that they were very fortunate to be professionals, they knew that they were often operating in professional settings where they were the only black people. And a lot of what consumed their energy was this quest to try to bring other people along, right, to diversify those kind of settings that they were working in. As a kid, it, it just seemed incredibly boring. And on top of it, I also thought that my parents were living in another era. I just thought that they were hopelessly out of touch with the times um, until I got to college. 
and I went to Yale. And very quickly, I realized that my parents had been onto something. I think of my freshman year of college. Another student, a, a white guy, said to me, he said, you know, Anne, there are a lot of, uh, you know, guys here, a lot of white guys here who are interested in dating black women because they think that they're sexually easy, basically. And, I, you know, believe it or not, I was shocked to hear that. I had never heard that. And the first thing that came to mind for me was I thought about my grandmother. I thought of my stern grandmother from Ohio, who was the, absolutely the last thing, the furthest thing away from any kind of permissive person. I was in college right in the period where the term African-American got picked up. And in fact, I remember it very vividly because I started college as black, basically. I did a junior year abroad in France, and I came back and found out that I was African-American. By the time I finished college, I had been exposed to so many different claims that different people made about how I should identify myself. You know, I should say I'm black, I should say I'm mixed. In France, I learned that I shouldn't say that I'm black, not that I'm noir, but that instead that I'm métisse, that I'm mixed. And I think it made me basically come down in a particular place for myself and say, you know, I think of myself largely as an African-American person because I understand racial mixture as part of the black American experience. Like to me, it's totally consistent being African-American and being a person who has non-African ancestry. Those things, they totally work together. So. So I think by the end of it, I, I came out feeling very comfortable with my identity as African-American, even though I knew that I would continue to have experiences where people might challenge that. I found myself one night in the, the library uh, as a student reading some work actually from a mid 20th century anthropologist named Ashley Montague, who had written this really terrific book uh, called Man's Most Dangerous Myth, The Fallacy of Race. And in it, he talks as a, uh, as a physical anthropologist about what we know about biology and how what we know about biology, even at that time, in the 1950s, was enough to tell us that there were no such thing as discrete, objective races, that human beings and biological variation in the human species is so kind of blended, it's so gradual as we move across the world that you know, there, there's no kind of sharp line splitting us up into categories like black or white. And it got me thinking about if people knew this already about human biology and genetics, how is it that this message is not more widely spread? And so that, that quest to understand what happened to the, to the message of race being socially constructed is really what inspired me to, to write the book The Nature of Race, in which I really, I try to study what it is that people in different disciplines, you know, experts in different disciplines have to say about race, and how are their messages about race received by, you know, by the public. I was interested in what was going on on the census, for example, these debates about maybe the racial category on the census, category should be changed to allow people to identify as mixed race. I have had the, the privilege of serving on the U.S. Census Bureau's National Advisory Committee for Racial, Ethnic, and Other Populations since 2013. With the change of administration, with the election of President Trump, that a lot of the things we thought we were going to be able to do have been rolled back. We were kind of on track to revise the census questions in a way that would allow for the first time a Hispanic or Latino box on a race question. There was also going to be a box for people of Middle Eastern or North African origin um, at the request of, of people in those communities. The administration has also introduced a plan to put a citizenship question on the census, which I think all of these things are going to have a very negative impact on how we capture the, the racial and ethnic diversity of this country. College as an institution prepares people for the world. You are about to meet a graduate student whose lesson of self reaches beyond the classroom. Here is Chelsea Green. My name is Chelsea Green and I am a quarter black, three quarters white, Sometimes I go into different communities wondering if I would fit in there. I am always looking, I guess, for a sense of that belonging. And I have yet to really find it in a racial way. I grew up with my mother, 
Um, I didn't grow up with my father. My mom sometimes felt like she never really fit in, um, certainly racially, as a biracial woman. I think she'd probably identify as being biracial. But my dad is Ashkenazi Jewish, like ethnically Jewish. And so I guess if someone were to ask me what I am, I would say I'm three quarters white and I'm a quarter black, but it's actually more complicated than that. I guess I would identify more with being multiracial because of the fact that the Jewish Ashkenazi ethnicity was so meaningful and important to the experiences of my family members. And even though being Jewish isn't a race, it somehow feels more appropriate to say that I'm multiracial than just biracial. My mom is a very vibrant person um, and she's complicated in many ways and I love her a lot. Uh, she, so she grew up with two parents. Her mother is white and her father was black. My mom never felt really quite white enough or quite black enough. So I too never felt quite white enough or quite black enough. I just kind of felt like I occupied all of the categories and yet none of them. I think growing up with someone so close, you take on a lot of their vision and their perspective on the world. When I was growing up with my mother, we watched a lot of news in the evenings. Um, and uh, when I came home from school, when I was in high school, I'd uh, sit down, start my homework, and basically watch several news broadcasts that go back to back. I'd watch uh, NHK World, Russia Today, RT, BBC America, BBC World, Al Jazeera, and get to see how they portrayed the world from all kinds of different angles. My window on the world was fairly small and watching all these news outlets and all their different takes on the world outside of whatever I had, all the things I'd never seen was really important to me. I grew up in the San Fernando Valley um, in Southern California. It's part of Los Angeles County. The first time I hopped onto that plane was when I was 19 years old was to come see my brothers for the first time in many years here in New York City. My brother Jonah and I would go out to Jamba Juice or ice cream with my dad. Um, it was often just the three of us and sometimes we'd also get together with my younger brother Aubrey and we'd all spend time together and that was really meaningful to me. Uh, they moved to New York City and so I didn't get to see them for a while until I finally came out and got to visit them. culmination of all these family experiences sometimes makes me feel like I'm so grateful to have come as far as I have and I have something bigger to serve here. So I'm now currently a first year PhD student at Harvard University studying international relations. I definitely say that my experiences and my background inform the kinds of questions that I ask in the classroom and the questions I'm going to ask in my research. Recent Pew Research data has illustrated that millennials are more conscious about gender inequality than people from previous generations. And I think the same is true when it comes to issues around race. So when I see graduate students around me talking about race and talking about gender inequality and maybe not seeing professors doing as much of the same thing, I don't think they're necessarily deviating too much from what their generations are doing in general. Um, but the good thing is that because we're talking about it, they're starting to talk about it. When we call it out, they start to listen. I was privileged to take a class with Condoleezza Rice my senior year of college. And after that class was over, a few people got together and decided they wanted to do a directed reading with her. And apparently I was selected, at least from what I was told, because I was not afraid of asking the hard questions and I wasn't afraid of looking stupid for asking those questions. We need to be 
asking questions that are uncomfortable and not necessarily representative of conventional viewpoints. And I care about who's not being included in the conversations and whose interests are being taken into account and not into account when we think about the American national interest or whose security we're serving and securing. And those kinds of questions are at the heart of my research. We need to understand what role race really does play in constructing and shaping our lives and how we think about it when we interact with other people so that we realize whether or not we're perpetuating inequalities or whether we're saying things that truly are unjust to other people. As a parent, reaching out to one's children can be challenging. This is a talk I had with my biracial children, Mina and Cameron, on the topic of race. I want to start the conversation by letting you guys know like when I met your mom in 1988 and we were talking about getting married and I was deathly afraid of that whole idea of marrying a white woman, specifically because I, in 1980s, I wasn't sure that I wanted to be part of a interracial relationship because of the children. So now in 2019, how do you guys feel about my fears then and in the reality today. I think we've been able to have like a relatively like normal life. I don't feel like we're that much different than other families who are not multiracial or multicultural. People don't really understand like biracial marriages and biracial families and the need to just want to blend and just make your family different. I remember when I was little, I had a teacher who asked me if you and mom were related because of our last name. Yeah, and yeah. It, it was just so weird to me because uh, like, I think I was like four or five years old and I was just like, my dad is black and my mom is white. For you, you were always sort of like exerting or uh, wanting to let people know that you were black. Why was that so important to you? I think it's so important to me because anytime I tell people that I'm Haitian, they're shocked, like just genuinely shocked. They would never believe that I could be Haitian. And it just kind of bothers me that people can't realize that in every country there can be multiple different races. I feel like I have the features of a Haitian person. I feel like I resemble you more than mom. So it was always important to me that people knew, no, I'm Haitian. I'm just very light-skinned. Mm -hmm. And Cam, you have a much more nuanced uh, view on this. I mean, you've evolved, like you said yourself earlier. And so can you talk to us about that evolution? And when you were younger, how did you feel? Yeah, I would consider myself black, or like at least like mixed black. I guess I didn't think about race like as critically as I do now. But I think like when like things really started to change for me was around the time of sort of when like Trayvon Martin was killed by Michael Zimmerman and then a few years later with Michael Brown and Ferguson and when I just started to truly realize just the extent of like inequality in this country especially as it pertained to race. Looking back when I was younger certain things that people might have said to me or ways that people acted around me it all started to come back to me. But it's interesting because uh you you kind of have a choice to decide what you want to be, maybe unlike me, for instance. And then you chose to assume, uh, to assert rather, your black identity. Why did you make that choice? I think there's less choice involved in it than you're considering mm -hmm. insofar as like, I guess there's sort of this adage I've heard before about like, if you're mixed race, like you, some mixed race people choose to be more white or some mixed race people choose to be more black, which I think in of itself is pretty reductive of like what it could mean to be white or black. In our society that is so obsessed with sort of racial purity, that's just been like a persistent like theme and idea um, that like half white doesn't actually exist as a concept. 
Like if you're half white, half black, you're black. You're half white, half Native American, you're Native American, if, you know, and so on and so forth. You know, there's no like, like, if you're not white, you're not white. Domino, let me ask you, how do you feel about your cousin from Indiana, uh, the white side of your family? I never really saw any difference between us. Like I never looked at them and was like, oh, they're white, I'm black. Mm -hmm. They were always just my family. When you uh, interact with my family in New York, how is that? Well, growing up, it always felt pretty normal too, because it's like they were still also my cousins. The only weird part is when you're in a room full of like minority or colored people, it's like the way a white person would feel in a room full of all black people. It's mm -hmm. just, you feel like people look at you a little more, like I've had from family, like, oh, you have such like a nice color and everything. No, you do. <laughs> yeah, see, it's funny when hearing things like that from your side of the family, like, oh yeah, you have such a nice color. Well, it's like, I feel the same about you. Like, you have a nice color. I don't, mm -hmm. I have pink and blue, but you have like a nice solid skin tone. Mm -hmm. So it was always just, it felt a little competitive. Cause you know, in all countries, the lighter you are, the prettier you are. And even, you know, that's absurd. But I feel, especially in Haiti, that's true. Like, the lighter you are, the... The higher your social status, yeah, too. Yeah, exactly. So I always felt, like, a little resentment because of my color, because I do get treated a little differently. Our high school is probably one of the more diverse high schools. And, like, this community in general of New Rochelle is, like, pretty racially diverse. It's really easy to just kind of be myself. Because in high school, no one really cared. It was more when we were younger that people were just so like, oh my God, your dad is black, your mom is white. What, that's absurd. But by the time we got to high school, it was just so common. My best friend is black. It's funny, because one time my dad actually took me to get my ears pierced, and it's the only time we've ever gone to the mall. And the woman went to my dad and was like, sir, you can't take other people's children to get their ears pierced. <laughs> and my friend was just like, that's not my dad, that's her dad. We've seen this lately in the last several years, how pop culture, particularly uh, commercials, it seems like every other commercial is of a mixed race couple, or you see the, the granddaughter who's mixed or the grandson who's mixed and then interacting with the white granddad. It is good that we have more diversity in various aspects of our life, but it would be sort of like, at least to me, naive to just sort of jump at that and see like we have reached the ultimate progress, you know? racial amount. Exactly. And I, I think that a couple of Cheerios commercials are not gonna <laughs> cut it. So what do you guys think about the uh, state of race relations in this country today? We've seen in the United States that people care so much about staying with who you are but I think now that Donald Trump is president, people are starting to open their eyes and realize like, you know what, it, it's okay to make my family different. And, you know, it's okay to be different. Well, like I think I saw some statistic um, where like most white people don't know any black people and most black people don't know any white people. Like we exist in this country together, but the black community and white community are strangers to each other. And that's, I think, where you can get a lot of like the distrust that is historically like built up between these two communities. One of my best friends is Polish, speaks Polish. Parents don't really speak English. Another one of my really good friends is Jamaican, born in Jamaica, all of that. Now they're really good friends. Two people from completely different sides of the world are friends because their mixed friend brought them together. Mixed people can only do so much to fix racism. There have been mixed people for the entire history of whenever, since there have been white people and black people in the similar space, there's been mixed people, whether or not people want to talk about it or not. So we can only do so much on our own. You know, the role that your white grandparents played in my life and how, you know, when I had my um, hesitations, about getting into 
a, a, a biracial relationship, you know, one of the things that I look for was, you know, what would be their reaction? And their reaction really, to me, spoke about what you mentioned, because as far as they were concerned, they were looking at a person, not a black person, not a white person. That's what was important to them. And obviously they're in the 70s now, but you know, they were really progressive and very simple people from the Midwest, but yet, you know, they had these values that, you know, we're not gonna prejudge people based on the color of their skin. And I think, you know, that's really the important thing. You know, parents have to play a role. You know, if you see your children, you know, uh, having, you know, racial tendencies, you know, you have to get them straight. That's our show for today. To learn more about the people you just saw, log on to our website at tv.cuny.edu. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time on Shades of Us.